On June 14, 1947, a rancher named W.W. W. Brazil came across something odd in his fields north of Roswell, New Mexico. There, strewn across some sagebrush, he found the wreckage of something metallic and shredded, almost like a kite, but unlike any kite Brazil had ever seen before. He then brought this discovery to the Roswell Sheriff, who brought it to the commanding officer of the nearby Roswell Army Airfield. The next day, the military released eyebrow-raising statement that a flying disc had been found in Roswell, then quickly backtracked to say it was not the remnants of a UFO, but merely the remains of a rogue weather balloon. In the decades since then, the truth about the infamous Roswell incident has only grown murkier and murkier. While some have claimed that the flying disc was actually proof of extraterrestrial life, the military has changed its story several times, insisting in the 1990s that what W.W. Brazil had found was actually debris from a top-secret spy organization called Project Mogul. So what exactly did Brazil come across on his ranch that day in June 1947? Was it a piece of an alien aircraft, the remains of a U.S. spy operation, or something else entirely? You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting's associate editor, Leah Silverman. And I'm staff writer, Kalina Fraga. And today, we're untangling the complicated story of what actually happened at Roswell in 1947. Stick around after the episode for discussion about the most compelling theories. As W.W. Brazil drove around his ranch about 80 miles north of Roswell, New Mexico with his eight-year-old son Vernon on June 14, 1947, he suddenly noticed a number of shiny objects. Scattered on the ground in front of him was the debris of a lightweight metallic material. Brazil later described it as, quote, a large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tinfoil, and rather tough paper and sticks, unquote. At first, the rancher didn't worry about the strange object he'd found. Lacking a radio or telephone, he wasn't aware that something astonishing had happened since his find, and that much of the country was now abuzz with rumors of flying disks and flying saucers, after a pilot in Washington state had reported seeing unexplained flying objects on June 24th. In the aftermath of that incident, some 800 other sightings were reported. Brazil only learned all this on July 5th, when he went to nearby Corona and met up with his brother-in-law, who excitedly explained the rumors. Brazil began to wonder if the strange debris he found on his ranch had anything to do with all the UFO sightings across the country. So, after gathering all the materials he could find, the rancher notified Roswell Sheriff George Wilcox. Brazil later said, quote, I was a little bit ashamed to mention it, because I didn't know what it was. I asked the sheriff to keep kind of quiet. I thought folks would kid me about it, unquote. Wilcox didn't know what Brazil had found either, so he alerted the nearby Roswell Army Airfield, which soon sent an intelligence officer named Jesse Marcel to check things out. Marcel examined and collected the wreckage, and then cemented Roswell's place in American history by apparently telling his superiors it was a flying disc. Indeed, it was the public information officer for the Roswell Army Airfield who made the startling claim that the debris found on Brazil's property was actually part of a flying saucer. As he told reporters in a public press release on July 8th of that year, quote, The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County, unquote. The report was strange even to the radio DJ who released it, as he allegedly questioned the information officer's claim, saying, quote, Don't run this story. If you do, you're going to be in trouble. They'll ship you out to Siberia, unquote. Yet the story ran, and it was quite a remarkable statement, but a short-lived one. Just 24 hours later, the military changed its story, telling the Associated Press that they hadn't recovered a flying saucer at all, but instead the debris of a downed, high-altitude weather balloon. Though Brazil doubted this conclusion, he seemed eager to wash his hands of the whole incident. The rancher told the Associated Press, quote, I am sure that what I found was not any weather observation balloon. 
but if I find anything else besides a bomb, they are going to have a hard time getting me to say anything about it, unquote. As time went on, the fervor around the Roswell incident largely died down, but a dedicated few never forgot, and in the 1970s and 80s, the mystery of what Brazel had found on his ranch received renewed interest once more. Though the military had officially labeled the debris found at Roswell as nothing more than a weather balloon and moved on, right from the beginning, some had their doubts. One of them was Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer who'd originally examined the wreckage on Brazel's ranch. Marcel had even brought pieces of the wreckage home to show his 10-year-old son, who later recalled that they had been inscribed with a strange script. Jesse Marcel Jr. later wrote, quote, I could see what looked like writing. At first, I thought of Egyptian hieroglyphics, but there were no animal outlines or figures. They weren't mathematical figures either. They were more like geometric symbols, squares, circles, triangles, pyramids, and the like, unquote. In 1978, Marcel Sr. agreed to sit down with Stan Friedman, a nuclear physicist turned UFO enthusiast, to discuss what he'd witnessed at Roswell. According to Marcel's wife, Linda, he and others had been, quote, told to keep it quiet, and they did for years and years and years, unquote. Now, however, Marcel was ready to talk. After speaking to Marcel about what he'd seen in 1947, Friedman intensified his search for the truth, interviewing other witnesses and poring over the documentation for what had happened at Roswell. His research later became the basis of a 1980 book called The Roswell Incident, which adamantly posited that W.W. W. Brazel had found the wreckage of an alien aircraft on his ranch in 1947 and that the U.S. military had covered it all up. What's more, the 1980 book suggested that the military had removed alien bodies from the wreckage, and as time went on, this detail was repeated by other reports and alleged witnesses, including by a man named Glenn Dennis. A mortician, Dennis came forward in 1989 after seeing an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on Roswell to report that a friend of his had seen three alien bodies in the aftermath of the Roswell incident and that there had even been alien autopsies performed on extraterrestrial remains. Amid the rise of science fiction TV shows and movies during this era, many of the rumors surrounding the Roswell incident were easy to dismiss as the product of overactive imaginations. But unlike in 1947, the interest in Roswell didn't go away this time. The renewed interest in the Roswell incident in the 90s was largely driven by the release of several books, all of which seemed to contradict each other and become ever more fantastical. The first was a 1991 collection of interviews by Kevin Randall and Donald Schmidt, titled UFO Crash at Roswell, which was written using the testimony of a hundred witnesses. While many of the claims in the book have been disputed by retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General Thomas DuBose, who was photographed with the debris just after it was found, and who also asserted that the pieces were surely from a weather balloon, the book did attempt to debunk the alien autopsy claims made in the 1980 book. But this was just the beginning in a long series of convoluted claims. In 1992, another book's claims doubled the amount of flying saucers found, multiplied the alien corpses to eight, and claimed that two aliens were even taken into government custody. Two years later, Randall and Schmidt released a second book, claiming that the alien bodies were actually taken to President Eisenhower himself. Meanwhile, a 1995 film titled Alien Autopsy was aired on TV to the shock and horror of millions. The film purported to be a documentary shot by U.S. military officials shortly after the Roswell incident. In 2006, however, the filmmaker admitted that none of the movie itself was real but stoked the fires once more by claiming that it was based on real footage that has since been lost. In 
In an attempt to quell the rumors spawned from the world of science fiction, the Air Force launched its own investigation into the crash in 1994 and released two reports about it. According to the first report, the debris was indeed not exactly a weather balloon, but definitely not extraterrestrial either. The debris was actually pieces of a high-altitude balloon with an experimental radar and sensors inside used to monitor Soviet nuclear testing. The only reason the Air Force wasn't completely honest about it back in 1947, the report continued, was because these devices were being made as part of a top-secret government program known as Project Mogul, which was being run covertly so as to conceal it from the Soviets. But if the flying disc wasn't real, then how to explain the supposed alien bodies? In a second report released in 1997, the Air Force published an image of what appeared to be black body bags on stretchers in Roswell. The report claimed that these are not actually body bags filled with alien corpses, but instead test dummies that were used in the balloon and kept safe in these insulation bags before being launched. Despite these explanations, there are many who still believe that Roswell was the cover-up of an alien crash landing. So let's get to the big question. Do you think that a UFO crashed at Roswell? Not that I'm much of an authority, except for <laughs> <laughs> the research that we've done for this podcast. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say that I don't think that this was a UFO of any kind, a flying saucer or extraterrestrial otherwise. Mm -hmm. This is a major spoiler, so spoiler alert. <laughs> but it makes me think of the X-Files, the end of the X-Files, where they discover that the aliens were actually all a plant by the deep state to throw the public off of the scent of their covert experiments because that's exactly what happened here. Hmm. The airfield was really quick to release a statement that it was a UFO because they actually wanted to cover up Project Mogul, which is what the Air Force later admitted happened. Right. But I think by that time, the damage had been done and people just wanted to believe what they wanted to believe. Yeah. And also... I feel like because the debris was aluminum foil and wood and otherwise very mundane earthly materials, it was likely not extraterrestrial. Like yeah. what are the odds that an alien would come to Earth with a wooden UFO? Yeah, with like the materials to make a scarecrow and put away your leftovers. I right, yeah, yeah. I feel like there'd be something much more high tech. Yeah, probably so. We've also all been to the DMV and know <laughs> firsthand <laughs> how disorganized bureaucrats can be. So it wouldn't surprise me that Roswell might just be the result of a bungled government investigation and cover up. Um, and I can also see how the dummy explanation and weather balloon might feel too perfect as answers, but I think that's because they're true and not <laughs> because they're lies. Right. Yeah, I could see that too. What are you thinking? Um, I agree. I think it probably wasn't a UFO crash. I think the oddest or one of the oddest things about this story is what the intelligence officer's son said about hieroglyphics. And I read one article that said maybe he'd seen Russian lettering and didn't recognize it because he was a kid. I think that part's pretty odd, but like that, the material doesn't exist anymore as far as we know. So we can't look at it now. Do we know anything about what happened to no, the material? No, I don't know. That's a great question, though. The Air Force just took it and swept it away, I guess. <laughs> also, how old was the kid? 10. He was 10. All yeah. Right. Well, it's pretty mean, young. Even if it was mathematical symbols, what would he know? He was 10. Yeah. <laughs> it could have seemed like strange alien writing, especially if your dad comes home and is like, an alien mm -hmm. landed. Look at this. And everyone's hearing the flying disc craze. I don't think right, we, can, exactly. we can downplay how deeply yeah. affected people were by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That and the Cold War and everything that was like putting people on edge. For sure. Cold War paranoia. Yeah. I think the weird thing that you touched on a little is just like, why say it's a UFO of all things if you want people to not look at something? If the whole country's like worried about UFOs right now or like spotting UFOs, why would you say we found one? Like, mm. it just seems like an odd way to distract unless it is like weirder than the truth. Yeah, I think it just took people so far off the scent of the truth. Like people were looking at these pictures of body bags, which were potentially test dummies and making up stories and movies about an autopsy. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing that, you're absolutely not thinking about anything more in the real world realm of technology, you know? Yeah, I guess they thought it was a lesser of two evils. It just seems like a solution that brought even more attention to Roswell. Mm. Well, I'm not sure what else they could have said. The weather balloon, I guess, and that didn't No one believed that. Yeah. Which also was strange to me because how many people had seen a weather balloon? 
by that time. I don't, to this day, don't think I've like really seen a weather balloon up close. Well, the the rancher said they had crashed on his property before, I believe. So he like oh. kind of knew like actual weather balloons. So he, maybe there were a lot of them in New Mexico at the time. They were near an airfield. So I guess. Right. So he. Incidents he, like this would happen. He seemed to think that he knew what one looked like, which is why he didn't think that this was a weather balloon. I'll say that of UFO and alien evidence stories, this is probably the least compelling to me, Mm -hmm. um, in part because it seems like there really is a cut and dry explanation that I'm happy with accepting. But there are other UFO stories that we've covered in the past, if you want to check them out on our (laughs) website, allthatsinteresting.com, that are much more compelling to me and much eerier. Yeah. Uh, One that comes to mind for me is the Kelly Hopkinsonville encounter. Um, which was an odd story in 1955 where there were a bunch of people on a farmhouse in Kelly, Kentucky, and they came running into a police station one night and said they'd been fighting with aliens. And it was a weird event because there were multiple people who all claimed to have seen the same thing. And they described seeing little silver men with glowing eyes who had crash landed nearby. Um, And a lot of people think that might be a credible encounter, although their neighbors thought that they were either drunk or they'd been attacked by owls. And I think one police officer, when he responded to their house, noticed them throwing a cat against uh, <laughs> the screen door. And the sound the cat made, he thought, was enough to like, convince someone that it was an alien. It's a weird, unearthly screech. I mean, I've heard my cat screech <laughs> in the middle of the night drunkenly and also thought it was <laughs> unearthly <laughs> so that's fair so that could be it but i think this one sticks out because well for two re- like it was the, multiple people said they all saw this and then this description of like little silver men sort of built into like little green men as it was being reported so this was like an important alien encounter possibly yeah and going off the idea of little green men little silver men um in 1963, there was a couple, Barney and Betty Hill, who claimed to have been abducted by aliens that they described as, quote unquote, creatures with slanted eyes. And they claimed to have been taken aboard a pancake-like disc glowing with brilliant white light Hmm. and were then subject to a host of experiments. Very weird. The reason I'm more inclined to believe this is because it involved a couple telling the same hyper descriptive story. Maybe Mm -hmm. not believe it, but to be compelled by it. And it's considered the first alien abduction story to be discussed in the States. Hmm. And interestingly, Betty's own sister the year before claimed to have seen one. Yeah, that's interesting about the sister. The Kelly Hopkinsonville encounter, one of the police officers, I don't think he responded to the actual scene, but he was like part of the department believed them because he had seen or thought he had seen like a ufo so something something was going on maybe in kentucky in the 50s it seems like you need a lot of witnesses and then one person of some kind of authority Mm -hmm. to legitimize your story in order for it to be put into the canon of alien abduction stories right but what's interesting about benny and barney hill is that um they were hypnotized by a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist actually didn't believe them Hmm. And um, after they were hypnotized. Yeah. And then the couple went out and found journalists themselves to cover the story. Hmm. So there is definitely some nuance in this, whether or not they maybe were lying for whatever reason people lie. But they bring up this. They're the first to bring up this idea that the flying disc is like a bright, bright, illuminating star, which is something that comes up six years later in the 1969 Berkshires UFO sighting. And this is fascinating because 40 people claim to have seen this UFO. And one family in particular, a whole carload of two kids, a mother and a grandmother in a car, everything went completely silent. And then some time skips. They remember being in like a wide configured room. Hmm. And then when they came back to the mother and the grandmother had switched seats in the car. Oh, so and weird. And they said it made no sense because why would the grandmother be in the driver's seat? Huh. I wonder if there was ever like any explanation that was, I don't know, if people Satisfying. accused them of like doing drugs. It was the 60s or it was They were nine kids. years old. Yeah. yeah. One kid was nine. And there's actually a Netflix episode about it on Unsolved Mysteries. And I don't remember who they interview. I think they interview one of the kids who's an adult now. But their whole family believed it. 
Like mm. his mother believed it. He believed it. His brother believed it. Their grandmother believed it until she died. Wow. And 40 people in the town total had seen something that night. So I feel like at the very least, there was something there. Right. Like yeah. Some craft made its way through whether or not this carload of this family was abducted in some sense. Mm -hmm. Who can say? Yeah. But totally bizarre that they would go with that story their whole lives. It is. It's interesting when you have like a group of people all saying that they saw something so unexplainable. It's so like on the one hand, there's the when the first UFO was sighted in Washington and then like hundreds of people suddenly start seeing UFOs. There's like something there where I think these ideas can spread. Mm -hmm. But when it, it's like an incident and multiple people report seeing the same thing. Oops. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <the UFO. laughs> Aliens. The aliens, yeah, that's odd, I think. I actually think the Berkshire's UFO is the most compelling alien abduction story that I've ever read. Yeah, that's interesting. It reminds me kind of of one other one, just of what you said about someone of authority and big groups. This isn't something we've covered, but in 1966, I think like 40 people in Michigan thought they saw something. And a police officer, I think there were like dozens of police officers there. It was taken pretty seriously. And Gerald Ford, before he became president, he was a congressman at the time. He was like, we need to investigate this. Like, this was like one of the first times they were like, this like might have happened. We need to look into it. It's funny what gets them going. Like, mm -hmm. What suddenly makes them feel like they have to do something about it. Right. What do you think was the inciting factor <laughs> in think, that one? I think definitely power and numbers. I'm not really sure what Gerald Ford's thoughts are on UFOs or what his thoughts were on UFOs. But maybe maybe he was a believer. I don't know. Um, it is interesting because in recent years, there have been like more congressional, more public congressional like investigations into UFOs. Yeah, much more formal looks. And yeah. Now they're being declassified. Right. Between 1952 and 1969, there was Project Blue Book, which looked into like a lot of alien sightings, UFO sightings. And they found that most of them did have an explanation, but like a lot of them didn't that they could find or that they told us about. And then this year, there was, yeah, the public hearings where, again, they were like, we can explain most of these, but some of them, we're not really sure what they are. And you just have to wonder when they say we're not sure what they are, if they actually know mm -hmm. what they are and they're just using the UFO as a guise right. to throw people off the scent. Yeah, just like they the did. A <laughs> <laughs> story as old as time. Well, then the final question that I'll pose is, do you think that aliens exist? Without a doubt. <laughs> I don't think aliens would come to Earth in a ship made of aluminum foil mm. and wood, though. Yeah. So while I think they exist, for all we know, they're made out of chemicals and elements that we can't even comprehend. So, like, there could right. be an alien right next to me, and I just don't have the faculties to perceive it. So, <laughs> Listening in on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. And laughing at us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I agree. I, I'm a big Star Trek fan, so I'm always like, that'd be so cool if, you know, there's other worlds and everything, but... I think if they do exist, they probably are in a form, like you said, that we could not possibly understand. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. I'm History Uncovered's producer, Kit Westneat. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to follow the All That's Interesting and History Revealed pages on Facebook and Real History Uncovered on Instagram. Make sure you don't miss out on the new episodes and subscribe to the History Uncovered podcast. And keep up with our latest stories at allthatsinteresting.com. If you have a question about the show or just want to say hi, feel free to call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring.